it's good to see you, brother. And we were just talking before we started this. We we're trying to figure out when we saw each other. So we thought it would probably have been um interview wise, not in person, 2020, but in person, somewhere around maybe 2019, but everything surrounding pandemic. So yeah, for, first it's great to see you. It's great Second, to see you too, dude. How did you survive the pandemic? Just curious, man. Uh, well, I made this. I made this record. <laughs> I, I, I'm kind of weirdly serious. Of like, they, you know, I mean, I is a gong show, like it was for everybody. Of, yeah. Uh, you know, th there were some like bright spots to it, and and some of that was like time to spend on various like art projects and that. And this this record, uh, originally I was planning on doing sort of a conventionally created in studios traveling around kind of album, and this became my pandemic record of just like working on most of it um over zoom calls and isolated in different studios and just sending tracks around uh and i but i say that in answer to your question be because that was kind of what i poured a lot of my energy into is that kind of stuff i had the time to do it but it also was like one of my outlets when you can't hang out with people and do normal social things it's helpful to have at least it was helpful for me to have something to be like working on yeah well, usually I save this for later down in the interview, but let's jump right into it right now. Make it official. What's the name of the new EP and how does it represent you in this stage of your career? Yeah, so this EP is called Hummingbird and I titled it that at the suggestion of my girlfriend. We had a we had a hummingbird that would come outside our window almost every day while I was working on this record for a couple of years. And she commented one day, she's like, oh, you know, like a hummingbird is the only bird that can fly forward and backward. Um, and it felt really like poignant to the album of this like huge step back in order to step forward. You know, there's a metaphor cooked in there, but also that the hummingbird is just kind of bizarrely mesmerizing to look at. You know, like if you're ever in the presence of one, yeah, man, it, it, everybody <laughs> shuts up and it's like, oh, it's so cool. It's it's this like quixotic kind of thing. Um, yeah, so that that felt it felt right um to go with that and that's that feels like the chapter that i've had here and one that i'm like weirdly grateful for despite all the like curveballs that got thrown at me and everybody what about the uh, new single what's that called and what's that one about it's called that's my country <clears throat> i wrote it uh out at my cabin i wrote it about going out to my cabin i wrote it about that place that's kind of mm -hmm. just like been special to me for my entire life it's like cut off from the rest of the world the opening four lines are when I feel too far gone, I throw on a song, something about Alan Jackson. He just gets me. And it, it that was the beginning of the song, like the idea for it, because every time I'd drive out there for years, I had this one Alan Jackson's greatest hits CD. It's still sitting in my truck. I throw it in. And, and it just, for me, it was like, it was important. It would allow me to like shut everything else off and, and just like go to a place that's, that's kind of like a shelter from the storm kind of thing. Uh, and I felt like that would relate for a lot of people, whether, you know, whether it's a cabin for everyone doesn't really matter. Uh, it's just having some kind of place that like you feel safe. Did you hide out there during the pandemic? Yeah. Yeah. I, um, <laughs> so I went up there, I went up there for what was supposed to be four days for my birthday in 2020. This is March, mm. 2020. Just wonder what happens. Um, and literally two days into that trip, uh, our flights home got canceled and the, like the all the lockdowns came in uh that, and that was the start of all of it and so myself and my girlfriend were up there and we we're like oh i guess we'll just stay and it became this <laughs> six month visit um where it just felt like a better idea anyway like well initially there was just no way to get back because there were no flights mm -hmm. um but beyond that it was like oh we can go back to living in like core vancouver where it's busier and that like the idea of like social distancing there was something you had to actively be doing. Whereas like out at my cabin, which is where I am right now, um, you don't have to work hard at that, man. <laughs> like there's just, just not many people. Uh, I, I would always laugh and I, and it really means in a given day here, you'll see more deer, rabbits and birds, but than humans by, by far. I love that, man. You know, yeah. and, and, and just, just so to remind you for me, I was one of those folks who was flying out to uh, Saskatoon for the Junos. Oh, yeah. And yeah I yeah. got caught because literally landed, no Junos, walked over to the kiosk, 
got my ticket to fly back, had to wait eight hours because I refused oh, to not dude. park with my luggage. And then we all came back and we were all still like, yeah, let's hug, you know, don't worry yeah, about yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. And then it was, it was, it was literally like, days, right? yeah. And then it was literally like, whoop. Yeah. And dude. I knew people who literally took, and I was lucky because I had one flight and it took me uh, on Air Canada. Some yeah. people had taken two flights and because of that, they were basically living at the airport for like three days oh because of God. COVID trying to get home. Dude, that would have been, I'm, I'm sorry you had to do that because that was like, like I, I felt like I was the luckiest guy in the world and that I just happened to have gotten off a plane at a place where like, it was like the pandemic out here at times you had to like remind like if you didn't watch news or anything you wouldn't know it was occurring because like normally there's just only a couple people in the grocery store anyways like you yeah. just you wouldn't get the vibe of it out here um so i kind of got to like the main thing i ended up doing was to work on the record i didn't have any like i didn't have my studio up here but there's a shed out back where i'd stored music gear uh for years like old mm -hmm. amps old like computer part like there was a computer that's 15 years old that the the tower's just sitting out there and so i was like huh i wonder if i have enough stuff out here to actually put together like a functional studio so i just started going out there in the afternoons for like a week and would like yank things out and be like oh i can do this i, I ordered like two connector cables on amazon to just like wire some of the stuff together and i got my roommate to send me a box <laughs> with underwear in it from my place in vancouver because i was like i didn't pack enough and, and all of it just surrounding one of my nicer vocal mics. And that was like, the rest of it was here. I just kind of put it together. And that's like what most of the records recorded out here. Like all the, all the vocals on that's my country are down out here. All the, a bunch of the guitar work on don't change all the vocals. There's like a t huge chunks of it that were done in that period of time. Did you have to, because I remember talking to a lot of people and they said, basically their, their closets became their sound booths. Did you have to, you know, put stuff up? Did you make a sound booth for so, yourself or? So here's the thing for me. I, when I, I have a song put out years ago called uh, The Way You Let Me Down. Um, yes. I was, I was, I was tracking it with, uh, with Todd Clark, who's like a really like well-known, like producer, done a huge amount of stuff in Canada, big like US pop stuff as well. Like, like very upper echelon dude. And so as we were tracking the vocals for it, I, I was in Toronto and I was like, oh man, I got a couple hours I can come by. Like maybe we can get the leads. And I went to his place then, and and at that point he just had like a studio set up in a second, like in an apartment, second bedroom kind of thing. And his kids were like playing in the next room, and there was a window open with like a, and there was a dude literally cutting his lawn outside with, and the window was open. And I was like, do we need to do anything about this? And he's like, you'll never hear it once I like once the vocal is processed and compressed in there. And I was like, I was I was skeptical at the time. That's the final record, man. Like that's what's that was, oh. and that was one of the bigger radio songs I've ever had. I, I, uh, it's not that I don't believe in sound treatment at all, but I do often think for like a vocal performance in a fairly quiet room or something, like by the time I am done compressing and limiting it later, you usually don't hear anything like that. So I, I just had a mic set up in the room and if, if, if it ever really bugged me, like, yeah, you, you could put up some stuff around it, but like, I'm one of the dudes who just never does anything about that. <laughs> so, it, you know. <laughs> it's amazing how Amazon became our best friend too. I mean, oh, dude. because I didn't even really have like a Zoom interview set up. I was doing phone interviews and suddenly I heard this thing about Zoom. I'm like, what is Zoom? Yeah, and I remember hearing I that figured it all out and slowly but surely, you know, Amazon, Amazon like started yeah. figuring stuff the out. Studio and... looks great, by the way. Yeah. yeah, I'll send you the picture. Oh, that's right. Um, and it's just we just, we figure it all out. Did you yeah. ever think that you could be cre that creative? Um, did you did how, I, I should rephrase it? Did you think you had it in you to be that creative, to come up with these things, to be able to create music? Because a lot of people had to be creative because yeah. they didn't have a choice. Totally. I mean, for me, it actually it didn't feel like a huge jump. I already had done a lot of like producing on my own. Like I'd already produced a bunch of demos. I had the studio set up. The, the thing that more changed indeed was like Zoom calls. <clears throat> the thing that really evolved was um, like, actually for me, some of it was, was liberating of having all kinds of time where there were no other mm -hmm. like in-person commitments where you could just be like, sorry, man, I'm just working on my record. And everyone's like, well, yeah, obviously, because you're not going to see anybody for nine months. So, so cool. Um, but it was doing Zooms and like some of the tech that, that went with that of, of like, 
So first off, that there was um, there was a big stigma around Zoom song rights prior to to COVID. People really didn't like that, especially like, like the Nashville kind of yes. crew really was not a fan of that. Uh, and some people still aren't. And and I wasn't either. I, I didn't like that kind of thing. I felt it kind of crushed the vibe. Um, but you had to do it. And somehow through doing that a number of times, I got to a place where I'm like, oh, I like this pretty much just the same. I'm it, if it allows me to write with somebody who's in Toronto, somebody who's in Nashville and somebody who's in L.A. all at once. That's pretty rad, like the access that gives you. And then it also for me, one of the other bigger changes being an actor, all auditions uh, switch to, to self tapes that you do at home. And that's never changed. That's that's still the way it is now. Uh, so like I've got lights set up now uh, uh, and like all the acting work I've booked in the last like three and a half years now has been through tapes done at home. And personally, I love it because like I'll explain this to people of like before well, one, you had to be in a specific city at a specific time. But also if you got a call from your agent that said you have an audition at 9 a.m. tomorrow, you have to drop everything you're doing at 9 a.m. tomorrow and like kind of clear your calendar. But if you have an audition that is just due at 9 a.m. tomorrow, well, I can tape that tonight or I can get up early tomorrow. And I, it, it just like gives you some a, a kind of freedom to like live on your own schedule. I feel like so many things, I mean, there, there's definitely a bunch of drawbacks to us, like all oh, living way more online that, that that's not lost on me. But for silver linings of this, there's a whole bunch of upsides in terms of like flexibility and freedom, which I, which oh, I like. let me tell you something for me, the zoom interviews have been the blessing when I would have to, if you remember, I had my equipment yeah. when we, we, you know, and I had to drag it down yeah, there dude, and put it all together and everything. Now, like for example, today I will do like four or five interviews back to back to back. To yeah. Back yeah. Back. And I'm done, you know, so, Man, you know, it makes a, I, makes a massive difference. I feel the same. I've got to write after this. The one guy's in Ontario, one guy's in Vancouver. I'm here at my cabin. I don't have to go anywhere. I, I started, I mean, I became like the total Zoom gremlin of in Vancouver. I'll often be writing with people who like are in Vancouver. And I'm like, nah, I'm going to do, I'm going to zoom in for this one. And they're like, come on, like be in the room. I'm like, no, I got a good idea. Like, I'm just going to work on it for the extra two hours that I won't spend in my car and, and zoom for it. So like, I don't know, man, it, I think it's whatever works. Like if, if somebody, if you need to like go and see people in person for that. And sometimes I do, I need to go and see people. Great. But if I need to get a bunch of work stuff done and I want to do a bunch of creative things, this works great for me. Like there's so many people I collaborate with people literally like all over the world in a way that like, Zoom is made way more flexible. Like the gone are the Skype days of like, there are like four pixels on the screen and you're like, are you showing me your guitar? Or like, did you take off a towel or something? Uh, yeah, man. So I, there was a lot of it where for me, uh, I think I, I dealt pretty well with, with a lot of it of just like, cool, I'm going to use this for like creative time. I'm going to, I'm going to write a couple of screenplays, which I did. I'm going to like create any, an album. I've actually, created half of my next album as well in the yes. before. So I'm already kind of like getting pretty deep into album four at this point. So that's, I'll think about that later for now. It's for now it's hummingbird baby. So how did you fit in, you know, one of the most, um, one of the best uh, Canadian series to come out uh, of the uh, red and white transplant how did you get involved with this, man? Especially because we're talking about the last season. Yeah. But, um, you know, when the U.S. jumps all over this, you know you got something cool I going I know. On. I was really stoked when I when I, when I I got pulled into it. I was like, oh, man, like NBC's all over this thing, too. And it's, like, got quite a following down there. Um, I, I, you know, it, it works the same as almost everything I've ever got into. Uh, I'm, I'm not Leonardo DiCaprio where I'm getting offers thrown at me. Uh, I, I'm, I sing for my supper, man. I auditioned for this, you know, I did my, I, you know, I had to do a medical audition. So I've got the like kind of crappy version of scrubs I'll put on. Um, I always laugh because when, when you, you, part of the audition for this was doing like, you know, it's, it's in surgery. Um, and so you got to have something to do with your hands and, and very early in my like acting training years, uh, at UBC, I had a, a professor like really, really stressed, like, uh, there was a scene we were supposed to be working on where you were like afraid that that God was coming to get you. It was this whole thing. And and all, you know, and so we're, we're working this, we're looking up and she's like, it doesn't look like you're looking at anything. She's like, I want you to to count the number of nails that are in the wall up there. And I was like, okay. So 
And she's like, try and do it as fast as you can. And so I was counting and counting and counting. She's like, great, that you've given yourself something real to do. Uh, and so I've always really hung on to that. Um, mm -hmm. So for this audition, I, I laughed. I was like, okay, I took a piece of paper and I took six paper clips and I would just be clipping them on and unclipping them as quickly as I could and playing out the rest of the scene. But it gave me something real to do with my hands. That's not like going to book you the part in and of itself, but it, it's better, I find, in a, in a scene where you could just end up doing a lot of bad miming um, to give yourself something real that requires some degree of precision. It'll make you, it'll just, it makes life a lot easier. And then you play the rest of it, you send in your Zoom tape and, and I was fortunate they, they flew me out to Montreal and we, uh, we shot the show in the, in the summer. And um, yeah, it was, it was really cool to get brought into that in their fourth season. It's, it's a really well done show. They bring in a bunch of like awesome doctors and real nurses to advise everyone on what you're actually doing because when you get to set you're not clipping pieces of <laughs> not doing paper clips on paper you have you have a person in front of you you have a body you have like real medical tools at, at your disposal but obviously i uh, spoiler alert i'm not a doctor uh so it was nice to have someone walk you through the procedure that you would be doing so that you feel you can do justice uh, to that, you know, and that's kind of the big thing in, in acting is you, you have to often pick up a skill to a level that makes it like, you always want to be respectful of whatever you're representing, whatever it is. And so that, that I really appreciated. And, and they were just like, yeah, they, they ran that thing like a well-oiled machine. I, so it airs uh, as of when we're taping this, it airs tonight. Fantastic. And a, uh, first off, you look like a doctor. So I can see why you got the part. But the other <laughs> thing that I never really thought about until I was watching um, an old episode of MASH, cool. they're all actors. Yeah. But the reason why I could never be an actor, especially not a doctor, is because my hand tends to shake a little bit. Mm. You cannot have an instrument in your hand as a doctor <laughs> and your hand is shaking. Unless it blows it, it blows it away. Unless you're a bad doctor. In which exactly. Case, I, but but I mean, worth noting, uh, uh, I bring that up because without revealing too much of, of my guy in this, not all doctors are created equal. And so in the case of me, we kind of had a running joke of, of calling my guy rather than the good doctor referencing the other show, calling my guy the bad doctor. <laughs> so there's a number of things I do that are that are not wonderful. And I'm like, man, this makes it easier because when you're not supposed to be great at the thing you're doing, then I can really just let myself walk into the room and be like, yeah, scalpel. Uh, <laughs> you know, you again within within reason. But yeah, dude, I know what you mean. That there there are limitations like that where, um, when you're supposed to be a master at something, you know, I watch uh, this show called The Bear. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's uh, yeah. I, I I love that show. And they're all you know, <laughs> they're supposed to be like spectacular uh uh uh, uh sh chefs in there. Um, and they're actors, right? So I mean, like you 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 need to be masterful at what you're doing. Uh, uh, I'm now losing the guy's name. Uh, he's the bigger dude. Uh, uh, oh, I know you talked about who, who, uh, who, who is like the fix it guy around there. Yes. Uh, I can't think of the name. This is going to drive me crazy. But the point is yeah. that guy is actually a like really famous chef. It's funny because he doesn't play one of the characters on the show <laughs> who, who is a chef, but apparently he's like where the buck stops, where they'll shoot something and he'll watch it and be like, yeah, no, that's gotta be more like this. Um, it's facts yeah the facts he's that, that's his name uh anyways um lost my train of thought entirely but oh yeah it's difficult when you have to be a master of something yeah you've got to like you got to have enough confidence of it but you actually have actually worked the thing like I, I was in a basketball movie years ago and i was supposed to be the expert three-point shooter and i became so like obsessed with this that i would go there was an abandoned gymnasium in town that no one was ever in and I would go there for like hours and hours and like five hour chunks, like as often as I could and just shoot three pointers. Um, because when it came to taping it, it or to filming, it was, it, it felt awful when it was like, you're the master three point shooter and they throw you the ball and you're just like, air ball. So you, you, you gotta, you gotta spend the time. It's kind of, you know, I, I don't feel like that stuff is like at the core of what makes the acting craft kind of thing, but it's these important yeah. like peripheral skills that if you can do them well, it makes your life on the day of easier that you're not panicking as much about the like additional stuff. You're just able to like play the scene. Now, in this case, it's really nice that they've got a staff of doctors and nurses around helping out with that. How do you mentally focus on these things where here you are, you, when you're dealing with your own career and you're writing music, then you're touring with Florida Georgia line and you've got, you know, these massive crowds 
And then you're on these amazing television series and movies. How do you mentally go from one to the other to the other? Like, how do you wake up knowing that, you know, everything here is okay? Because if it was me, I'd be waking up like, what's going on at this moment in time? It it definitely, let's see. So, I mean, I, I panic about a lot of things, but, but <laughs> yeah, so that's, that, that's one way, but I, I, I don't have too much of an issue with the transisting between. I've sometimes thought about that, like, oh, that is actually kind of strange. Cause I'll struggle to like get out of a car, get my keys in my pocket and like go into a store. But the, the creative transitions of like, I feel for whatever reason, based on how I'm wired, I can pretty comfortably like be sitting, writing a screenplay, go tape an audition, go play a show and those things all feel somehow related enough in my brain as to just like uh i've i have way like greater difficulties with just other life transitions um that other people probably have an easier time with but i do find the like creative transitions it just feels it feels weirdly natural and some of it's just doing it a lot you know like yeah. i'm i've been you and i have been chatting for for many years now on this and like a lot of it's probably gotten easier where it's like as much as i'll panic or be worried about stuff at some point i try to trust the precedent of like oh i have done this a bunch before in theory i can do it even if it feels uh challenging today music's one like that where i'm like okay i've I've been up on enough stages that like if you put a guitar in my hand and a microphone in front of me there's enough muscle memory there to like to know what to do um and 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 as to the size of the stage it almost becomes non-important at a certain point where like like I, having played literally everything from shows to one or two people up to like actual sold out arenas at, at some point they become pretty similar you know like uh the odd thing the arena shows feel closer to the tiny shows because you lose track of people like when when a crowd becomes past a certain point you can't really clock it anymore i think the biggest a crowd can seem usually is like a few thousand people and then you just lose scope of it because humans are bad with big numbers <laughs> Um, yeah man so uh i'm i'm fortunate in 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 the sense that like i like all these things man they just feel like outlets of of creative energy that usually when i'm doing that kind of stuff on the days i actually get to do the creative stuff that makes me feel good mental health wise which i like uh you know so i keep turning the crank hey before we uh wrap this up holiday season's coming up man any plans for the holidays yet I'm figuring all that out right now. It's like, you know, there's always a bunch of like travel stuff to be worked out. And then yeah. the last couple of years were zany in Vancouver. Um, it just like, <laughs> if you expose that city to any snow, it just like, I, I grew up in a snowy climate. Vancouver is not geared for that. Like the whole thing goes, it was, it was wild last year, man. I, I was trying to rent a car there that had like snow tires and that was larger than the one that I have in Vancouver. And like, I showed up at the the Hertz dealership and they were just like, basically yelling at people being like, we don't have any cars. Like, if you got a reservation, <laughs> you're an idiot. Like uh, the, 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 uh, the woman, I, and I, she was talking to me, I was like, but I reserved this like two months ago. She's like, well, we couldn't have known there was gonna be snow. I'm like, but there's always snow at Christmas. On Christmas. This happens every year. This is why I did this. this it's the Seinfeld scene, man. It was it yeah. a reservation, but they did not hold the reservation, so. I, my main hope is to not get stuck in in airports. <laughs> that's my, okay, that's, that's my goal for a holly jelly one, man. Fingers are crossed, brother. Look, I'll let you go, man. It's great talking to you. Congratulations. Uh, I'll be watching tonight, um, and I will be. Uh, what any shows coming uh, soon? Do you think? Uh, music ones, yeah, probably next summer, but probably nothing okay. before then. Um, it might be already into like my album four stuff kind of coming out, so that would be yeah. that would be rad. Um, you know, get a little, get a little family time in for the holidays, and then gear up for uh for for a new year of doing doing stuff. I've also I got a Christmas movie coming out, so I guess that's one of my. That was the other thing I forgot yeah, to yeah, ask yeah. you about. Yeah, no, no, I I I, I should answer that too. And you when you're asking about Christmas, some sometime in December, Cape Holly Christmas will come out where I play Luke. The country singer it is if a doctor is is a is a big stretch for me this is like bringing it right close to home where they're just like all right do you have a cowboy hat and boots i'm like yes i do <laughs> let's let's do this 
Brother, you are a chameleon and you make it look so easy. And I know it's not, but um, I'm just glad you're doing what you're doing, man. Like I said, man, you just know how to keep those steps moving forward. And it makes the rest of us go, you know what? If he can do it, I got to try to do it too. At least, at least try. So congrats, man. I'll look forward to the movie. Where's the movie going to be showing? Is it theater or is it television? Is it I think it's television. like Hallmark? I think it's Hallmark. I, I, the way th these things go is sometimes you don't actually fully know the network while you're shooting it because sometimes yeah. that's evolving, but that would be my best guess. It'll, it'll be TV for sure. Um, Cannot wait. But, but, but really, th thanks, man. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for all the kind words and everything. It's always honestly like a pleasure chatting with you.